Hi there, everyone. My name is Prerak Juthani. I'm a third year internal medicine resident, and today I'm going to introduce you to another concept in the Intern Essentials 101 series. This series is all about high yield topics for anyone interested in medicine. It provides a holistic overview of a very high yield condition. Today we'll be talking about canademia. And even if you're a medical student or a very late undergrad, these sorts of things can be very helpful to kind of get you into the mindset of what it means to take care of patients with very critical conditions. Today we're talking about canademia. Canademia means canada, which is a genus of an organism. It's a type of fungus. And emia means in the blood. So this is specifically referring to when you have canada growing in your blood. A lot of the things I'm going to talk about today all come from very specific guidelines. So I want you to know everything is evidence-based. And specifically, I have the IDSA, Infectious Disease Society of America, guidelines for managing uh, canademia. And then um, you also have Stanford Healthcare's guidelines, which I'm showing you here. With that being said, there's going to be a lot of stuff. So let's just start with the basics. What kind of organism is Canada? Well, you can think about animals, you can think of plants, but you can also know that there's something called fungi. Canada is a type of fungus. And now when you think about fungus, I want you to know that there's very different types of fungi. Specifically, there's yeast, which are usually unicellular. There's molds, which is usually when you have, as you can see on this side, you'll have hyphae and microconida, and sometimes you have dimorphic fungi, which is both yeast and molds, and it depends on the type of environment that, that they're in that will determine whether or not they're yeast or mold. When I'm talking about Canada, that genus is a specific type of yeast, which means it's a type of unicellular organism. There's also Cryptococcus. Cryptococcus neoformis is something that shows a budding yeast with India ink preparation. This is a high yield step one tip, but that's also a type of yeast. Canada and Cryptococcus are two types of the most common yeasts. Now, when you think about molds, those are the things that often form hyphae, and that usually refers, the way I remember it, is through the acronym RAM. R-A-M. Rhizopus is the first one, Aspergillus is the second one, and then Mucor is the third one. Those are the types of molds. Then you have the dimorphic fun fungi. Dimorphic fungi can often be yeast, but they can also be molds under specific types of temperatures. So you have blastomycosis, you have histo, and then you have coccidiomycosis. So these are the types of dimorphic fungi. Those are the ones that you often get tested on step one, but today we're going to talk specifically about Canada. As I said, Canada is a type of yeast, which is a subset of the fungus group. So what is canademia? I already alluded to it earlier. It's when you have um, Canada growing in your blood. There's different types of species of Canada. You have albicans, you have glabrata, you have, I don't even know how to say this, para Parapsilolus, you have that one, right? You have these different species. When they grow from your blood, that's something that you should take very seriously because most people think Canada can be a contaminant. However, when it's in your blood, it is never a contaminant and you should never assume that it was. Um, if Canada is growing in your blood, you should reach out to infectious disease and then you should do the things that I'm going to walk you through. The way to diagnose canademia is oftentimes when you have blood cultures and they will be growing Canada within them and then that's ultimately the definitive diagnosis. The presentation of someone with Canada in their blood is very similar to anyone that has any other organism growing in their blood. You usually should not have other organisms aside from red blood cells, which are, you know, cells. You should not have bacteria in your blood. You should not have yeast in your blood. You should not have um, uh, what the molds in your blood. You also definitely should not have viruses, right? So well, oftentimes the way we check for infection in the blood is we take your blood when you come in. And if you have fever, hypotension, tachycardia, hypotension would be if you have a systolic blood pressure less than 90. Or if you have tachycardia, which is a heart rate greater than 100, we might think that you're infected. So we take cultures of your blood and we see what grows. And canademia would imply that Canada grows from the blood. So these patients usually are hypotensive. They are often altered, which means they might be a little confused. And they can have other symptoms like abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. However, if someone comes in with canademia, they're often uh, going to have a broad differential. This presentation I just alluded to earlier, um, the sepsis, hypotension, altered mental status, maybe fever, those things can also happen if you have a bacterial infection, if you have a pneumonia, if you have a viral infection, or if you have an autoimmune disorder, or even if you have malignancy, right? So cast a very wide differential diagnosis because that can often help. With that being said, the definitive diagnosis for canademia is when the blood cultures grow canada, okay? You often don't need fungal cultures, and if you look at the 
specific Stanford guidelines, you'll see that Canada species often take longer than bacterial pathogens to grow. So you usually will see growth within your blood cultures within 24 hours. On the other hand, glabrata takes a little bit longer, 48 to 72 hours. And you should think about Canada as a source of infection and anyone who maybe has a central line or someone who is severely immunosuppressed because those individuals are very prone to getting fungal infections. Blood cultures growing Canada should never be considered fake news because Canada species are usually normally in the skin and they're also within our lungs. But if they're growing in the blood, that's definitely not where they should be. So if you isolate Canada from the blood, that's something to worry about. If you isolate Canada from, for example, let's say you do a bronchoalveolar lavage and you see that you have um, Canada in there, or maybe you do a skin culture and you see you have Canada, that's fine because that's where Canada usually is and that's where it's found. But in the blood, I definitely would take that very seriously. That is an issue. With that being said, the fact is, anytime you have someone with hypotension and you're worried about infection and they have a fever, that usually means that you're worried about sepsis. Sepsis is a very, very broad word, but the way I like to think about it is if someone has a low blood pressure or if they have a fever, or if they have a heart rate greater than 100 without an enticing cause, if they usually have like two out of those three things, and they also often have a lactate and you're confused and they're confused, that in and of itself tells me that there's something more subliminal going on. Whenever that is the constellation of symptoms, that's often what I like to call concern for sepsis. And if there is concern for sepsis, you should begin treatment immediately. And specifically, you should begin treatment with IV antimicrobials. So if you think this patient, for example, they just aspirated and you know that they have a very high risk of aspiration pneumonia and you think that they're septic now because the aspiration pneumonia may be seated their blood, you should start IV antibacterials that cover aspiration pneumonia and also cover most of the organisms that will be found there. Let's say this is a patient with an indwelling Foley. They come in with fever, they come in with hypotension, and they also come in with suprapubic pain. Chances are they might be bacteremic, and they might be bacteremic from a urinary source. So you want to start antibiotics for a urinary source, presumptively. So the whole point is anytime you're concerned for sepsis, you want to start IV antimicrobials within one hour. If you don't know what you're covering, you can start broadly and narrow as you find out more information. Um, the other thing you want to try to do is to give them fluid. Oftentimes when someone comes in with hypotension and you're worried about sepsis, the underlying pathophysiology of sepsis is that you usually have an organism that's causing a massive inflammatory response that leads to systemic vasodilation. Systemic vasodilation means that your end organ perfusion is going to be much lower because the, um, the resistance is directly related to the radius of your blood vessels. And if blood vessels are larger, you're going to have lower resistance and that leads to lower blood pressures. So you need to give fluid to ultimately still continue to perfuse that. And the way you give fluids is by giving 30 cc's per kilogram of body weight of that person. So if they're 100 kilograms, you usually want to give three liters of fluid within the first three hours. You can then do other basic things. You can get a lactate. Lactate, you'll know that cells go into lactate anaerobic glycolysis when they have um, less perfusion. And so if the lactate's elevated, that suggests that there is some um, uh, non, there is some aspect of people not being perfused properly. Um, and then ultimately, you want to make sure the blood pressure or the mean arterial pressure is above 65. And the way you want to do that is by giving fluids as the first line. And if it still is not getting better, then you want to give them blood pressure medications called pressors. This is kind of an aside, but it's still a very good way to understand how to treat someone with septic shock, because oftentimes someone who has canademia is going to present with signs of concern for sepsis. Ultimately, how do you treat canademia? The way you treat them is with the canacandins. These are drugs that actually inhibit the synthesis of 1,3-beta-D-glucan, which is found in the cell wall of uh, fungi, and that ultimately, when you inhibit that, they can't make their cell wall, and therefore they will die. So the way you can treat it with the caspofungin, mycofungin, and then as you slowly treat the canademia, you can transition to fluconazole um, or voriconazole when they're more stable. I would also try to make sure you remove any central lines because that is my, likely the source, because canademia is a skin flora. And if you have a central line that goes all the way down to the life, to your right atrium, or maybe even to the superior vena cava, that is a very good entry point. And chances are that could be the source. So you wanna to try to remove them if it is possible. Obviously you wanna establish other access. If the patient is very sick and they need pressors, chances are you need to give them a new central line, but you should take out one that's been in for a long time if you think that is the source, especially if it's red around that area, if it's painful, that's pretty much likely gonna be the source. 
And now, how long do you treat for? Usually you treat for 14 days after clearance of blood cultures. So if your blood cultures grow Canada, you should repeat them within 48 to 72 hours after starting the appropriate antifungal therapy. If now your blood cultures have cleared, you want to wait for 14 days after that first clearance of blood cultures, which is deemed source control. You obviously want to try to remove lines as appropriate. And if someone is neutropenic, neutropenia, as you know, neutrophils are one of the cells that come to an inflammatory response. Neutropenia means an absolute neutrophil count less than 500. Then you often want to continue treatment until the neutropenia resolves because neutropenia in and of itself can be a risk factor for canademia. So I hope you enjoyed this video. We went over the presentation of canademia. We went over how to holistically treat someone with septic shock-like physiology. And we also ultimately went over the diagnosis, clinical presentation, and how to treat canademia. If you like this video, please drop a like, comment, share, subscribe. It means the world to me. I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.